Hi friends, this episode of Big Blue Banter is brought to you by Prize Picks. Head on over to Prize Picks and use promo code BANTER and they'll match up to $100 on a new deposit. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always by my co-host Nick Filato and a recurring guest, one of our favorite guests. And I know you guys have clamored. We wanted you, you wanted him back on, and here he is. He's John Schmelk of Giants.com and the Giants Huddle Podcast. John, John, how are you doing tonight? We're doing great, boys. Always good to talk to you. Draft season is always the best, John. And before we get into some of our draft questions, we want to ask you about some of the guys who are currently on the roster. Just get your opinion on them. See what your expectations are. We want to start with Cordell Flott, who was a third round pick two years ago in Joe Shane's first draft. I feel like a lot of Giant fans are sitting here saying, what is the role for Cordell Flott in this secondary that, let's be honest, has some holes, right? So what is his role? Do you envision Cordell Flott possibly as a starter opposite of Deontay Banks outside on the boundary? Or do you think he might be pigeonholed into a nickel slot type of spot? What are, what are your thoughts on him? Yeah, I think you guys have identified some really good questions. Unfortunately, for a couple of them, my answer is going to have to be, I don't know yet because I haven't talked to Shane Bowen yet and I haven't talked to a couple of new coaches yet. So I'm going to put out there out there first. I don't know how he sees Cordell Flott in his system, right? Now, in his own system, you're going to need your outside cornerbacks to tackle because you're going to allow some shorter catches and you're going to need to tackle. So I know he's put on some weight since he got drafted, but he's still a lighter player. So does he think he can tackle on isolated situations on the outside? I don't know the answer to that. I think he played outside corner as a rookie, and I think he covered a little bit better outside than he covered inside in his second year. But I think his body type is that of a slot guy. So I, I think it's a complicated situation, to be honest with you. I think with the way the team is structured right now, before the draft, he's going to be the best player at one of those two positions. Now you get to the draft. You can always add veterans in free agency after the draft once the comp pick thing goes away, right? So right. we'll see. I My guess is that he'll be involved in one of those roles, but until we see what Shane Bowen thinks of him in his defensive system as opposed to Wink Martindale, I don't think we're going to have a good feel to it until we see some stuff in OTAs. And honestly, we're probably not going to know until we see preseason games we get deep at the training camp. Yeah, that's fair. And cornerback is a position that takes so long to develop. I remember when they drafted Flott, he was so young. I liked him because of that, but I really liked his length and those moments on tape where you saw him click and close and you were like, there is something there. And it's been a rough, you know, there's been injuries there, but I'll be interested to see how he fits the system too. Talking about another guy now, John, because we want to keep it a little bit with you on the roster building side, because there are some interesting points as we go into the draft. Another guy who has had bad luck with injuries so far, that's Evan Neal, Giants former seventh uh, overall pick. I remember last year when we talked to about Neil you brought up a really interesting nugget from Howard Cross who was on the sideline and just could tell he wasn't himself in 2022 2023 injuries again where are you at right now or where do you think the Giants might be at or even your you and your analysis with Neil as far as is he the right tackle one entering camp will there be an actual position battle this year which there really wasn't last year um and if you could give the Giants maybe some hope on the former number seven overall pick where what would what would your pitch be Look, he's played 22 NFL games, and that's including the two playoff games last year. So he's barely played more than one full season worth of games. Now, would we have liked to see better play last year before he got injured? Absolutely. As Joe Shane said in his postseason press conference, he has to play better. There's no question about that. If I wanted to give the Giants hope on the fans, hope on the player, here's what I'd say. You have a new offensive line coach in, in Carmen Brasillo, who's coming over from the Raiders. He's a disciple of Dante Scarnecchia, who is one of the best O-line coaches in the history of the league. Uh, so he brings a lot of that expertise with him. We've seen him do well with offensive linemen that had struggled in the past. Uh, to quote Jermaine Illuminor in his interview to me, I stunk my first five years in the league. Then he gets with Brasillo, and all of a sudden he has his two best years in Vegas, right? Yeah. So, and, and he was also with him as an assistant O-line coach when he was in New England. So I think you have hope that with a new O-line coach, a guy that has not played a ton, maybe he can connect with something to correct some of those issues Neil has had. Uh, you know, there's been balance issues, you know, trying to recover, things like that. But again, he's been dealing with a bad ankle, a bad knee. You know, has he been 100% healthy? I still think there was good enough tape from college where I believe that there's something there as a player. Um, there, It's funny, and I'm learning how to do this evaluation stuff as you go, just like you guys are, right? And when I watched Evan Neal coming out, I'm like, all right, I'm going to watch all his pass pro stuff because that's the most important thing, right? You mm -hmm. watch it, and he was really solid on his college tape. Yeah, I know. But then, 
And, and the comments that people made at the time, a few people were like, well, he was on the ground too much. And I'm like, you know, I watched a lot of his passport. I didn't see him on the ground. Well, if you watch his run game stuff, he was on the ground yeah. a decent amount. And it's actually the same thing with Olu Fashinu this year, right? You watch his passport, he's phenomenal. Then you watch him in the run game, he's on the ground a lot. So you have to figure out if, if that's something that can be fixed as an offensive lineman or is that something that's inherent and, and you can't get around. But I think we're going to find out with a new coach, right? Um, I love what the Giants did this offseason. Um, I wanted to target Michael Owenyu because I thought he was the perfect guy, right tackle as the backstop for Neil, right guard. If Neil works out, if he doesn't right tackle, perfect backstop. Well, the Giants decided to spend big on Brian Burns in the trade. And instead they bring in kind of like the mini version of Owenyu, right? In Illuminor, who I think if Neil works out a tackle, stick him in a guard. I think you're okay. You can compete with the guys in there. He can be your swing tackle. And if Neil struggles and you have to maybe move him into guard at some point, he can go out there at right tackle. Based on what Joe Shane said at the owners' meetings, my guess would be that he's going to start at right tackle. He's going to be there in OTAs. Um, this is Neil. And then he'll probably be there at the start of camp. But they'll probably have a little bit of a quicker hook, depending on what he shows. I wouldn't expect that hook to happen until after multiple preseason games and maybe even multiple regular season games. But I think they have a lot more confidence in their swing tackle situation with Jermaine Illuminor where they'd be willing to make that change if the struggles continue. Again, we haven't talked to these guys about this. This is just my impression, my guess. I don't know anything. But I think when you bring in Illumino or a guy that started at right tackle for your current offensive line coach for basically two years in Vegas, you're bringing that guy for a reason as a backstop to that position. So I think they believe Evan Neal has it in him to be good at right tackle still. And just to be clear with fans about this too, and I never said this about Eric Flowers for a reason, Evan Neal cares. Mm -hmm. All right. He's a good dude. He tries hard. I, I, I tell people all the time, you go into that locker room for media availabilities after practice. The dude is looking at his iPad, watching his practice reps every single day in training camp. He's eating lunch by himself outside of the table, rewatching practice at lunch during training camp. He cares. He's trying. This is important to him. And He's liked by his fellow offensive linemen. Like he's part of the group. He invited them all to his home last offseason. The Giants were there. We record the whole thing. There's a feature on Giants.com about it. So I think put all that together. I, I still think there's hope for him to be a, an effective quality starter. I like Evan. I'm rooting for him. And I think he'll figure out a way. Guys, look, he doesn't have to be a great athlete. He's six yeah. seven with gigantic That's arms. Just play inside out. And make the guy run around you. Thing. It, 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 it yeah. isn't super complicated to me, to be honest with you. <laughs> That's what we're all hoping for, man. We need that uh, seventh overall pick to hit. And I want to talk about another young offensive lineman. And I'm not 100% certain if you talked with Carmen Brasillo. I know you mentioned earlier that you haven't talked with a lot of the... Yeah, uh, I haven't yet, unfortunately. I'm looking... Okay. I, I chatted with him briefly down at the Senior Bowl after the hire, but nothing. And I was like, for two minutes on the field, I was like, oh, you're in the media. I'm not going to say anything to you because we didn't got a chance <laughs> to know each other yet. So I haven't had an in-depth call talk with him yet. Okay, excellent. But I'll just... Wanted to get your opinion on Josh Azudu. We were fans of Josh Azudu when he came out of UNC. Just uh, it hasn't all come together and injuries are a big reason why. So we just wanted to kind of pick your brain on on what you think of him. Yeah, I always liked his athleticism, right? I thought when he came out that he was a guy that moved really well. And I think that's why they decided to give him a shot at tackle last year, just because of his feet and his ability to move. Um, I haven't seen enough yet. I don't think we've seen consistency. We see the athletic flashes. And I think a lot of that has to do with his inability to stay on the field and play in one position for multiple games in a row, uh, which I think is, is important for an offensive lineman to get comfortable with the guys around them and the, what they're being asked of him. So I still think the team believes he can become a player, whether that's a starter this year, or he you know starts out as your primary backup at a couple different spots. And then he works his way forward. Maybe heck, or maybe he's one of the starting guards come opening day. I don't know the answer to that question, but I think they do believe he has the athletic skill set to, to do it. And I think he's one of the guys they hope with Carmen Brasillo coming in that he can mold him a little bit and take those tools and turn him into an effective player. Yeah, I really agree with you on that. I mean, there was a moment in the Jaguars game from his rookie season where I was just like, this guy is going to be a fun offensive lineman to have. Fans are going to love this guy in the run game. And then injuries, I think, have also played a big factor there for Azuda. It's really unfortunate back-to-back -back years with that. I want to talk about another position, safety. And I remember just maybe a month, maybe it was a few weeks after Joe Shane got hired. He did a podcast with you, John, and he really hammered home. And this is something that stood out to me, the importance of positional value and how he's going to approach this roster reconstruction. And 
And I feel like we saw that come into play a little bit this off season with the Barkley and McKinney decisions. And not a little bit, not, yeah, a lot, not, yeah, not, not a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and the Ryan Burns decision as well, because that's a big play for a player at a really premium position. Um, and they now, basically, by the way, traded those two salaries for Barkley and McKinney right. for Burns. That, that's basically exactly. what they did. And in some ways, they traded Leonard Williams for Burns almost straight up. And not exactly, because it's 39 versus 47. But in, in a sense, they did. Close enough. Like, close enough, right. Now, as far as what, what's left behind, I think, at least according to Nick and I from our film review last year, just going through all the games, one of the more unsung heroes on the roster was Jason Pinnock. There were a few issues at times with filling and tackling, but... Other than that, I feel like he did a really good job of just playing the safety position in his first year, really starting in that type of starting role. What do you have any thoughts on how the Giants view or how you view uh, Jason Pinnock and Dane Belton moving forward? Are they potential pieces that could play a bigger role than people expect this year? Yeah, Dane Belton's been around the ball a lot. He makes plays on the football a lot of the times, in my opinion, at least it's, it's him being the beneficiary of some bad throws and mm -hmm. then they, they just kind of go into him a little bit. But I think that the team likes him right now. I think you pencil him in as, as the second starting safety. He'll you know compete with Jalen Mills, I think, for that spot. I think there's a reason they brought Mills in um, to compete with Belton for that spot. As for Pinnock, it's interesting because I think Wink Martindale found a really good role for him around the line of scrimmage, right? Mm -hmm. As a blitzer, a guy that I think supported the run game really well. You had a bunch of plays where he's coming in backside on, on some of those inside zone plays and he gets the running back from behind. I'm curious to see how he does in that split safety scheme that Shane Bowens yeah. played so much in Tennessee. Now, I like the fact you're not going to ask him to be that single high safety because I don't think that's necessarily the strength of his game. I think he can do it, but he's not that sideline to sideline range type of guy like McKinney was, in, in my opinion, right? Uh, but I think he has enough range to play that split safety role. I think you can bring him down and run support if you need to on early downs as one of those two split safeties. You do want that guy, though, in those situations to be able to cover one-on-one -on -one in the slot. We haven't really seen Pinnock asked to do that much, again, in that Wink Martindale system. So I'm curious to see how his impact is affected by the defense Bowen's putting in. But I think, as a, especially as a safety around the line of scrimmage, I think he was a pretty darn good player last year. And with the two read coverages that we're going to see a lot of where you're just basically going man coverage off of whatever the wide receivers run, you're going to need some of these safeties to be athletic enough to play man coverage. We saw yeah. that with Kevin Byard. We saw that with Imani Hooker mm -hmm. in Tennessee. I think Pennock can do that against the big slots and the tight end. But once you get a Wandale Robinson type of guy up into his toes, you know, to eat into that leverage, you could have some issues there. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that wide receiver room, a little transition there. What are your thoughts on Jalen Hyatt? on Wandale Robinson, on Darius Slayton. We can imagine right now, John, that the Giants are probably going to select a wide receiver, right? That's what it seems like. And then you would have nice four wide receivers in your room with Slayton, Robinson, Hyatt, and whoever the Giants do select. So what are your opinions on this room and their upside? I think it's a fun room, but I think they're missing the centerpiece of the room, right? It's like you, it's like you got a bunch, it's like you're trying to build a room, right? And you got, all right, this is a nice little accent piece. This is a nice thing you put in the corner. This is on the shelf. It's nice. But you're missing the thing that brings the whole room together, right? And I think that's what the Giants are looking to do in the draft. It's you want to bring in that wide receiver that can bring that whole room together. Because I think all three of those guys as complementary pieces are very effective and they're good at what they do, right? Wando Robinson, a good yak guy out of the slot. I think he can win one-on-one -on -one in short areas with a short area quickness. Um, I think he's a good player. I think Jalen Hyatt right now is a really good vertical threat. I think he has to work on the other parts of his game, but he tracks the ball well. Um, I think he has good awareness on the sideline, and that's what he was good in college, right? That's what we thought he'd be good at his first year. We, there's a reason he but didn't get drafted till late because in, you know, later on day two, it's because he had these other things he had to work on based on the system he played at Tennessee. We saw flashes, but again, I like him as a complimentary deep threat to an X wide receiver. Darius Slayton, same deal. I think him and Hyatt overlap a little bit in terms of their straight ahead speed and, and their ability to win vertically. But he's not your traditional X that's going to, you know, win contested catches, win one on one on the you know narrow side of the field if you're on that hash mark. But guess what? There are guys in the draft that can do that. And you're going to be sitting there at pick six and you got a choice of three of them. And look, Harrison and Odunze are more similar and we'll get into the receivers, I'm sure. Um, and neighbors is a little bit different, but he can certainly win one-on-one -on -one in those situations too. So yeah, I, I like, I like the players, but I see them more as supports to a real number one. Um, you know, you take a look at the giants receivers, compare them to just the receivers in the NFC East and where they would rank. And I think that'll tell you the story in terms of how you need to insert a number one into that room. 
and the, the term I've been using, I think that number one wide receiver is a force multiplier for the rest of that wide receiver room. And I think it makes the other receivers in that room better if you can find that guy that teams have to pay extra attention to, which is why we've been talking about wide receivers so much on uh, the Giants Huddle, on Draft Season Podcast, Big Blue Kickoff, all those shows. Because, look, you lost Saquon Barkley this offseason. Darren Waller, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, nobody does. <laughs> and going into last year, they were your two top weapons, and you haven't returned. Look, you've gotten a guy to play Saquon's role, but Devin Singletary is not a guy teams are going to game plan against, right? Good player. I think he's going to be a good starter this year. So you need a guy. Every offense in this league that's worth a salt guy has at least, guys, has at least one person you have to game plan against. Yeah. Otherwise, defenses can literally do whatever they want. They're dictating to you. You're not dictating to them. So the Giants need that guy that teams have to game plan against and Luckily, they're in a draft at number six where there's three of those guys, and boy, they're all really good. What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons, and one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform, and it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. You ever feel sluggish or out of focus? Are you stressed? Has your digestive system caused discomfort or flatulence like a certain co-host on this podcast during a live stream? If so, you should check out AG1. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my daily health. I had more energy, I was better off at the gym, and I could focus on my work in a much more efficient manner. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. Not only did I replace my multivitamin with AG1, but I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I recommend AG1 to all my family and friends because AG1 has a team of doctors and scientists that formulate around the latest science and maintains high quality standards within the industry. Even my friends have started drinking AG1, and they always tell me how energetic they feel and how it's helped them out at the gym, and also it's helped them manage their stress levels. That's why we're happy to have AG1 as our partner. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs when you first subscribe. Go to drinkag1.com slash banter. That's drinkag1.com slash banter to check it out. Our mental and physical well-being is of the utmost importance. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all need to take that very seriously. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this episode of the Big Blue Banter podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or 
EE system. If you haven't heard of the EE system yet, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. Whether you're here in New York, New Jersey, Arizona, if you will, or hundreds of other locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash banter to learn more and find a center near you. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D healing.com slash banter. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment. And before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, include EE system. Yeah, and we're going to get into the draft very soon. We want to talk a little bit more roster construction, though, with you, John. Tight end is a position you kind of hinted to there, and it's a very interesting position. We've been accused on this podcast of being Daniel Bellinger truthers, but, you know, both Nick and I stand by it, and we will continue to because the tape tells the story. He's open in a lot of spots where people aren't realizing that they see it on the tape, including on the vertical plane and inter- intermediate, and his blocking is phenomenal. And then the Giants added two players this offseason who are, again, going to be big Blue Banther favorites because they can block and they can win on the line of scrimmage in Manhurts and Stalls. So I'm curious. And then obviously the Darren Waller situation, as you mentioned earlier, we just don't know what's going to happen there. So I'm curious if you feel like the Giants can go into this thing. Let's say they don't have a decision yet on Waller and it takes long because I know Joe Shane even said last week or the week before, like, we're not going to push him on this. This is not the type of thing you push somebody on. You just kind of when he tells you how he feels, that's it. So say they go into the draft and there is no decision on Waller. Do you think that that they are in a position right now where they can comfortably leave the draft without a tight end and just go forward with Bellinger and those two tight ends? Yeah, yeah, I think you can. Um, and, and I Cager, think you can always add somebody else in for agency if you want to, right? Lawrence Cager's in, in the building still. If you want to, you know, he, he can help as a receiving tight end. And I think Bellinger would be a solid starter for you. I don't think he blocked quite as well in his second year as he did in his first, to be quite honest with you. Um, I think he's actually almost been a better blocker from the fullback spot as he has been from mm-hmm. as an inline tight end in, in some instances. And I think he's a, he's a, Good solid receiver. I think he's more the guy that's that's going to get open in schemed up situations, whether it's in play action. We saw them run even the play action from the fullback position a couple times last year. We they run the, the little fake. He's the lead blocker, and then he goes out into the route. You know, I don't think he's a guy that you know you're going to game plan one on one matchups against you know corners or safeties mm-hmm. against things like that. But that's fine. You don't need to have a ten and that can do that. Uh, good solid player. Uh, I think I think they can leave the draft without a tight end. Um, I would like to know what Darren Wall is going to do before the draft. That'd be nice. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, I think Bellinger is a good player. I think he'll he'll help you. But I, I don't think, to, to my point earlier, he's not a guy that I think is going to be a one-on-one matchup winner consistently week in, week out if you get him isolated. That's fair. Talking about one-on-one matchup winners. The Giants had one in 26 since 2018, and he is no longer here. And he's still in the NFC East, and that's a little painful. But looking at this Giants running back room, you got Devin Singletary, you got Eric Gray, you got Gary Brightwell. I want to kind of tie this in with the draft a little bit, John. How high do you think running back is on the Giants' mind right now? It seems like they didn't prioritize it in free agency, but uh, do you think the Giants would be comfortable going into the season with this as their running back room? I think they'll want to add somebody. Um, How early in the draft it is, I'm not sure. I do think even though there's no, in my opinion, uh, a running back I take in the top 50 picks in this draft, maybe not even in the first two rounds, to be honest with you. Um, I think once you get the third and fourth run, I do think there are, you know, eight to 10 running backs that are pretty good players and I think can fill a role for you. I'm not sure there are many full time 20 touches a game players in this group, but with Devin Singletary already in the building and Eric Gray in the second year, you hope he can give you something. You don't need a guy that can do that, right? So, what type of player are you looking for? You're looking for that big body guy that can get some tough yardage inside because Singletary is not the biggest guy. I think he's a good short yardage guy, to be honest with you, with yep. his, you know, low center of gravity. He's, you know, it's hard to find him behind the line of scrimmage, but do you want a bigger back? Do you want a more of a back that can match Singletary's skill set So they're interchangeable in the way you use them. I'm not sure what they're looking for exactly, but they really are running backs of every shape or size in this class with what you want. So I think you get that pick at the top of the third round will be the earliest. I think about it. But I think even at the top of the fourth round, you know, somebody could be sitting there where you pull the trigger and you have a guy that can be a part of that running attack next year in one way, shape, or form. I am curious to see what they think of Eric Gray. 
because he really didn't yeah. have much of a chance to contribute last year. And I liked him coming out. Doesn't have a great, I actually think his running back tape similar to Devin Singletary, to be honest with you. He doesn't have that great top speed, but I think he is shifty in short areas. He catches the ball fairly well. So I'm curious to see exactly how much of a role they're willing to give him in the run game once the season starts. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And I even think Gary Brightwell had some moments on tape two years ago, and I know he was injured last year, but someone just to keep an eye on as well there. And it's interesting because during the Shane tenure with with Brandon Bean over in Buffalo, they did were, they did take a lot of mid-round running backs. It was kind of their thing. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see the Giants go that direction. But moving to a different position, John, and we'll do a couple more, and then we'll get to the fun stuff, the draft. Uh, interior defensive line, such an interesting transition for the Giants. They had B.J. Hill, Leonard Williams, Ashawn Robinson. All those players are gone, all really good players. Um, but leaving behind them are two players who definitely showed flashes last year. I think, especially if you watch the tape, it's DJ Davidson and Jordan Riley going into 2024. Could any, could either of those two maybe uh, garner a bigger role than people are thinking? Um, or do you think they'll still be kind of role players to the Giants and they maybe bring someone in at the end of free agency, like you said, after the comp picks or just through the draft? Look, I, first of all, let me give some love to Ashawn Robinson. I thought he was fantastic. Yeah, down the stretch. He was really, really good whenever he had the chance to play. So I want to give him credit first. You still have, you know, Nunez Roches there, Nacho. I think he right now is your second guy. And actually, we've actually had this debate a little bit, you know, talking to Dan Salomon and one of our writers and stuff like that about what type of defensive tackle you want to add, right? If you mm -hmm. want to add a guy to the room. Do you want that guy that gets upfield, that more of a three technique, that can rush the passer a little bit? Um, or do you want more of your plugger to help a run defense that, again, was not very good last year? You hear Joe Shane talk about Shane Bowen's defense. He wants guys like one gap guys that can get up field right and penetrate and rush the passer a little bit. I think Jordan Riley is a guy that I think did show in, in points last year that he can be that big body run stuffer. So I think he's a guy that can fill that role. Davidson is kind of more of an in-between guy. He can do a little of both. So I wouldn't mind adding kind of that pass rushing three technique that you can have in there on passing downs. If you don't want to, you know, reduce either Thibodeau or someone like that inside as a, as a three technique and passing downs, if, if Ojolari is healthy. So that's what I would look at, but I, I think Riley and Davidson will both have a chance to compete for a rotational role at defensive tackle in camp. And if one of them plays well enough, could they surpass, you know, Nacho and snaps? I wouldn't put it past them. I think as of right now, given the room, once you get past Dexter Lawrence, it's a wide open competition and they'll let the best man win. Again, given what Shane Bowen wants from his defensive lineman. LSU's Makai Wingo is a player that kind of comes to my mind when you're talking about somebody who might be available a little bit later in the draft. And by a little bit later, I just mean third round plus because yep. Braden Fisk after his combine basically played himself out. You're looking for a, an, an interior defensive lineman with upfield burst, but also somebody who has the lateral agility and the experience slanting and creating pressure with four men because that's what Shane Bowen is going to do. It's going to deviate so much from what Wink Martindale did. What do you think a Hall from night? Ohio State He's another guy putting that. Category. I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him yet, but that's somebody else. And I've heard the Baylor kid is somebody else to kind of uh, monitor. I can't remember yeah, his Gabe name. Gabe Hall. Right Gabe Hall, I think. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. He was at the Senior Bowl. Yeah. So, but I think defensive line is is one of those. Like, I would not be shocked if on day two the Giants spend a pick on the defensive line. We're like, oh, defensive line, really? But they just you're going to need to prioritize stopping the run, and it's something that that they really tried to do last off season. They brought in Ashawn Robinson, they brought in Raheem Nunez Roches, and they signed Bobby Okereke, and the run defense was better, but statistically it wasn't that much better at all, which is very really unfortunate. There are other variables to that. But one more question before we transition to the draft, and it's just the linebacker room. We're talking about run defense. Bobby Okereke knocked it out of the park. Micah McFadden definitely took a step forward last year. But behind those two players, it's really not that much. Isaiah Simmons is not here anymore. So I wanted to kind of um, get your take on, on Shane Bowen. I know you didn't, haven't talked to him yet, but what do you think the Giants might do in the draft, or will they do anything in the draft to address a linebacker position that is somewhat devalued in today's NFL? Yeah, it's a good question, you know, because what does he think of Micah McFadden? And I think that that's a fair question, you know, and I think a lot of people have some confusion. They think Shane Bowen's like this, this odd front guy. He's really not when yeah. you watch the tape, he runs basically a wide nine with four men down on the line most of the time. So I think the interesting question is how much does he want three linebackers on the field mm -hmm. on early downs? Right. If you line up with Thibodeau and Burns at your two ends and Dexter and whoever wins the other defensive tackle spot, right, as your front four, 
how often is he going to want to play a traditional 4-3 base with three linebackers on the field? I don't know the answer to that question. Is he going to be a three safety team where that third guy in there is a safety? Is he just going to be a nickel with three corners all the time? I don't know what his process is with that. I'm looking forward to seeing it. But if they do need that third linebacker on the field, I think it'll be interesting to see if they would rather bring in a bigger defensive end and then put Kayvon Thibodeau there as a stand-up linebacker a little bit because he did drop in coverage a little bit. I think he does have the ability to do that sort of stuff on early downs if you want additional run defense in there. Or do you bring in another linebacker on day three of the draft? I would not spend the day two pick on a linebacker in this draft. I, I just don't think it's a great class, and I think you have bigger needs at different spots. And look, same thing with the safety position, by the way. I should have brought up when we talked about that. There's going to be veteran linebackers and veteran safety that you can get on the free agent market once the draft is over, I think, to fill those spots as a little bit of a veteran backstop at those positions. So I wouldn't be surprised if they don't draft guys at those spots because, again, I don't think the class is particularly strong at either safety or linebacker. Yeah, I think that's something that you can still address in free agency at relatively low cost a little bit later in the offseason. I'm with you on that. I'm really intrigued to see, like you said earlier, John, how Sh uh, Shane Bowen does you McFadden. Cause I was looking back on his season recently and it really culminated with that breakout game. I would call it against Washington, the first Washington win. And there was like a nice three, four game stretch. He started slow, but it wasn't the finish that maybe some were hoping for. And I just, I'm curious how much of it was him fitting uh, what Wink Martindale and his system and what he wanted so much or, and how he might fit what Bowen does. So I'll be interested to see that, but let's turn it forward to the draft a little yeah, bit. John. Real quick while well, McFadden, yeah. by the way, still too many missed tackles he's got to yeah. clean that up like you look at the the total if you look at pff's rankings just for an it's example high. and you look at the total missed tackle spots he's way too high on that list he's got to clean he gets yeah. to the ball really well he's just got to finish more consistently yeah and that's something that we'll see if, what what shane bowen thinks of that but let's let's get to a little draft talk here john and we're going to start at we're, we got two positions we're going to start with of course the, the ones that every giants fan wants to hear about and we're going to start here with the quarterbacks um i want to get your thoughts and we can kind of break into a discussion here maybe uh shoot off on each player or one or the other but i want to get your just thoughts on specifically uh these six quarterbacks caleb williams you can go in any order or talk about the ones you feel uh that you know most strongly or least strongly about but caleb williams drake may Jaden daniels jj mccarthy michael Penix, bo Nix, and, and maybe spencer rattler i'm just curious how you see this class how you evaluate these players and, and what kind of prospects you see these guys as yeah all right before people aggregate this answer, let me just repeat. <laughs> I have no idea what the Giants think about yes, this guy. Yes. In fact, the We're Giants. John. We're not asking. Yeah. Joe oh, Shane and here. the Giants, by the way, don't know what they think about these guys left. The scouts just came back like two days ago to finalize the board. That's when they get together with the coaches and Brian Dable is there. And trust me, Brian Dable is going to have a huge role in terms of deciding what quarterbacks they might like because he's the quarterback guy, yeah. right? And they have Mike Kafka in there. They have Shea Tierney. They're going to respect the coach's opinions on these guys a lot. So that collaboration has barely started. I'm sure they've had discussions on the side. So anybody, any word that's out there, well, the Giants like this guy, the Giants like that guy, it might be one person's opinion. But trust me, they have not finalized anything yet. So, and I'm going to apologize. This will be a long answer because quarterbacks no, I, are probably... I asked you a long question. The question is... Yeah, it's long. fine. Um, so Caleb Williams, let's start there. He's my quarterback one. Um fairly clearly I, I don't think twice about that a ton to be honest with you his accuracy is just off the charts for me uh, I think it's phenomenal I think it's the best in the class especially on the move his ability to throw with touch or velocity on the move and be on the money is great um I hated the USC I, I couldn't stand watching their oh. offensive tape last year it was brutal uh, I mean, they have these designer plays where if one guy gets open, he can make the play. But if that guy doesn't get open, there's like no second or third option. No. It's like, all right, the first guy's not open. Caleb, figure it out. I, I don't know how you operate that way. Uh, his offensive line was also, uh, I believe the phrase is not good. So he was <laughs> running for his life a lot. And I don't know how he's going to play if he has to be on time all the time. But I saw enough where I think he'll be okay. He's got a good enough arm. I don't care about all this crying in the stands, pink phone crap, whatever. If the guy, and look, I hate comps where you're like, oh, he's going to be a Hall of Famer. But he literally looks like Patrick Holmes playing football. That's how he plays. He is that almost uncanny internal sonar where he knows where all the defensive players are around him in the pocket and he can yep. slide and slip away from them to buy extra time. And he doesn't do that to run. He does that to throw. Mm -hmm. And he does it extremely well. So put all that together. Caleb Williams is my number one guy. 
Um, Drake May is my number two guy. I have him in um, Jaden Daniels relatively close, though May has pulled away as I thought more about it. His flashes on tape are just too big for me. Like you go, oh, just watch his Georgia Tech game. And he has more NFL level tight window throws over the middle of the field between 10 and 25 yards in that game than I saw on Jaden Daniels' date maybe the whole year. I mean, I it is a ridiculous game. And there's a couple games around that Georgia Tech game where that's when May was cooking before he hit that rough three game stretch at the end of the year where he was unbelievable. And you can look at some of his advanced stats and his heat map and what he does in that middle of the field in the intermediate area, which is where you have to make your money in the NFL. Right. That's where he's the best. Now, is he scattershot sometimes? Is he inconsistent with his accuracy sometimes? Yes. Sometimes you're like, wow, where the hell was that ball going? Did he sometimes try to play hero ball and force some throws that turned into interceptions? Yes. Much like Caleb Williams, his offensive line was terrible. His wide receivers did not often get open for him towards the end of the year either. So I think he was in the worst situation of all six of these quarterbacks that you talked to me about. And frankly, it's not even close. So I like the flashes. Are there some things to worry about? Yes, I think that can get coached out of you at yes. the next level. Brian Daniels. Jaden Daniels, number three. His combination of speed as a runner and athleticism with his accuracy as a passer, especially down the field on deep balls, makes him extreme a very high floor prospect to me. Um, I don't see the same creation ability as a thrower. That I see with Caleb Williams, he's more of a scramble to run type of guy. And he was in the best situation of any of these quarterbacks with a great offensive line in front of him, rarely pressured, and then two wide receivers that could go one in the top five picks, one in the top 15 or 20 picks, right? And there's a lot of deep perimeter throws on his tape that are great. Not as many of those tight window throws in the middle of the field. So I think that's something he has to improve on in the NFL. And I think it's tougher to improve on that than for May to improve on the things he needs to improve on. Agreed. I think Daniels is, again, higher floor. But again, I think in order for him to hit the ceiling, he needs to improve on some of those things that I think are instinctual and tough to figure out in the middle of the field. So like him as a player, if he's available at six and the Giants picked him, cool. Down with that. Um, but a little bit behind May for me. McCarthy's interesting. Before I watch, and I watched every drop back. And is he your four, McCarthy? He would be your fourth? McCarthy's my fourth. Okay. And I watched every drop back of those top four quarterbacks this year in college football. It took me three weeks. It oh, sucked. yeah. <laughs> but I did it. <laughs> because I thought it was that important. And going in, I really didn't think I was going to like J.J. McCarthy. I thought I was going to come out of that tape because I watched probably six or seven mission games on TV during the year, you know, mm -hmm. casually not really locked in on them, but I watched enough of them, especially the college football playoffs. And I didn't think I was going to like his tape coming out of it. And I'd be like, all right, mid second round pick, but he's very accurate in those middle of the field areas. I talked about, he's very accurate on crossing patterns. He really, his strength is throwing those, you know, darts in the middle of the field between that 10 to 20 yard area and he's accurate with him when he has the room to step into his throw, right? Um, he has a good enough arm. It's not as good as Drake Mays. It's not as good as Caleb Williams. It's not as, it's probably on par with Jaden Daniels, I'd say. But he doesn't have a lot of throws on his tape where he layers the ball and has a lot of touch. His deep ball is the worst of the top group of quarterback, except for maybe Bo Nix. Him and Bo Nix, I think, are on the bottom of that group where he doesn't get really good arc on his passes. He throws everything mm -hmm. kind of like a line drive, and he, he sprays a lot out of bounds. And I think we saw that on his first few deep throws, even when he was thrown at the combine in his, in his throwing session down there. But he played an NFL offense with Jim Harbaugh. Uh, he understands those concepts. He's a smart player, you can tell, in terms of how he runs the team. He's basically Captain America at the podium with the way he talks. That's why coaches are all falling in love with him when they talk to him. Um, so... I like all that, but I'm not sure I foresee a ceiling for him where he's going to be able to carry your team and compete with the likes of Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Justin Herbert, um, Aaron Rodgers, you know, Stroud, go down maybe. that list yeah. of all world, like I can beat you by myself on any game type of quarterback. I see him more as a little bit more athletic Jared Goff, Kirk Cousins as a high-end result for him type of guy. 
I could be wrong about this. He could turn out to be like a Tom Brady level processor and end up being a, a superstar because he is pretty mobile, right? He can move yes. around. He, he, he can move in the pocket. I think he's, you know, he's more than good enough in that area. So if I'm picking at any point where the blue chip prospects are gone. So after 10 and I need a quarterback, I'd be comfortable. Um, especially if you don't have anyone in house, Broncos, Vikings, Raiders, and you need a quarterback, I, I'd be willing to pull the trigger there. I don't like the opportunity cost at six, just because you're passing on one of these special players we'll talk about in, in the next segment. Um, Michael Penix. Before you before you go to your next yeah. guy, I want to I want to talk a little thirty thousand foot view on 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 McCarthy, and we could talk, yeah. potentially talk quarterbacks after this, Nick, if you want to. The first three, but you bring up something that I think is really interesting, and it's opportunity cost, and it's not just the idea of maybe taking that quarterback at six. It's the idea that some people, you know, floated around of teams potentially trading up for JJ McCarthy. And to then, by the way, Dan, I don't want to interrupt you. You're future. right. Th that fourth guy is not going to be there at six. Right. The Vikings, Broncos, and Raiders are so desperate, and right. I would be too if I were them. I the trade up for a quarterback and the Cardinals and Chargers are so willing to get out of there and maybe even the Patriots, there's going to be four quarterbacks in the first four or five picks in this draft. So if the Giants want one of those guys, they're going to have to move. Yes. And that conversation starts with next year's one. And yes, then it's what else do you have to give? Right. And yeah. with the state of the roster we talked about, are you in a position where you want to bring that rookie quarterback in with this going around him offensively with the inability to add guys. And you already have three huge money contracts on the books and Dexter Lawrence, Brian Burns and Andrew Thomas and Daniel Jones is still on your books too, at least for next year. That becomes very difficult. I think to build around that rookie quarterback offensively. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. No, it's interesting. And it's, it's a, I like talking to 30,000 of you stuff because it's like, you, you, you let's say you trade up for McCarthy, right? Any team, not the Giants, any team who does that. Now you're talking about a prospect who we're not sure as you, and I'm with you, John. Like, I think he could be potentially a plus for a team on his rookie contract, right? During those yes. five years, or it might even be less. If he wins early, he's going to, his him and his age are going to get together and get a contract earlier. But once you get that, it's to me, it's about that second contract when you're getting the 50 million or 45 million against the cap, whatever it may be. Are you able to now win divisions consistently for your team? Or are you now maybe wild card and maybe out? And that's what I'm not sure about McCarthy. And if you're trading up for a prospect like that, it's not only the opportunity cost of like losing, let's say the Giants just or any team took him at six. Now you're also giving up like a first round, two first round picks, your first round pick this year and your next year first round, probably more than that. To me, I'm with you, John. If you're going to do that for a quarterback, to me, he has to have top five, top 10 upside in the NFL at some point in his career. I have a couple quarterbacks in my mind that I believe fit this bill. I personally only would do it for Mayor Williams if it was up to me. Those are the only two that I see, and I see a drop-off after May. I see, I, to me, May is closer to one, and I love Williams, than Jan Daniels is closer to, to May because I see the issues we brought up with Daniels really scare me. Like When he's scrambling, he's looking to run and the middle of the field stuff. And I also don't love his arm the way some people do. I think Nick and I kind of viewed this uh, last few weeks watching a lot of neighbors. Some of those deep balls to me, he has great touch, but some of them I felt like they were short. They were a little underthrown, and the, and the receivers had to slow down for them. And I know Nick I talk, talked about that as well. So, But but getting back to the car thing, it's really interesting opportunity cost because as you go on to Penix, and I want to I discuss Penix with you. I, th I think he's your five. What do you do? Does opportunity cost you change at all when you're considering the idea of let's say the Giants go with a wide receiver at six and they let, love panics, for example, trading back from 47 into the first round to take that quarterback at some point there. Now they're Intel, right? Because now there's another opportunity cost that you're giving up 47, possibly next year's one, probably not, maybe a two, a couple, a few twos. I don't know the, exactly what the trade chart would say, but that's another th example of something. Where are you at with that idea? Because I know Giants fans have asked us about that a lot. I don't consider Knicks and Penix to be first round quarterbacks. Me either. That's just my opinion. Um, I thought I would like because then I watched a lot. I've watched a pretty good amount of Washington this year. And I thought what would hold me back from Penix was his medicals. And that is still a concern. We don't know anything about that. That's one of those things where we can evaluate draft prospects, the medicals and the medicals, whatever. Um, I was, and, and I watched his last six games every snap. And I came out of that saying he's not as accurate as I thought he was watching him on the TV copy. And he doesn't deal with pressure well at all. Um, I know he had the great first round of the college football playoffs. That was great. Guys were wide open all over the mm -hmm. field. Um, he benefited from having 
three receivers that I think will be day one and day two picks. I like all three of the guys. I think they're I all good. Those guys. Yeah. And he threw a lot of contested catches to Roma Dunze, who's literally maybe the best college wide receiver I've ever seen at contested <laughs> catches. Phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. And I just don't, if he doesn't have a brick wall in front of him and a bunch of guys getting open down the field, I, I yeah. don't see how this works at a high level. Same. I worry about that. Now, if you can pick him at 47 and you don't have to move. Okay. I, I would be willing to take that chance as a developmental guy with Daniel's injury history and stuff like that. And, you know, Bo Nix, his arm strength is something that is a real concern for me. There, You know, a couple of these late throws over the middle float. He figures out a way to get him in there. I'll give him credit. Mm -hmm. Out of all the quarterbacks, he is the one that kind of gets his foot down and gets the ball out on time more than the other ones, in my opinion, which is why I think you've seen a lot of former quarterbacks say, all right, I actually like Bo Nix because I think he is a, is a rhythm passer more than yep. maybe some of these other guys. But I just don't know if that high level arm talent is there for Nix where I, you know, I'd be willing to use a first round pick on him. But again, if he's sitting there at 47 and that's the guy you're thinking to develop a little bit, I would be okay with that too. Because to your point, it's one pick. You're not dealing right. multiple picks to select that guy. And I don't mind taking flyers at the quarterback position given again, Daniel Jones' injury history. As a prospect, by the way, Daniel Jones is better player than Penix, better player than Monix. Just take their tool set. Even when he was coming out in the draft, better player, in my opinion. So I don't mind using the one pick in round two to hedge your bets and just throw darts at quarterback because that's what you do in this league, right? You keep throwing darts until you find the guy. Okay. So go for it. I'm 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 for that. But I don't. I don't think I'd be in favor of trading back into the first round, which is, by the way, as much as I like the Brian Burns trade, and I think he's 25-year-old pass rusher, I think he's going to be a double-digit sack guy. I think he's the best pass rusher on the team, not named Dexter Lawrence today. Uh, maybe the best, depending on, you know, Dexter's nose tackle. It's tough. But trading that 39th pick, oh, my God, it ripped my heart out. It, yeah. it killed me. I was sitting here for two months. Job, you guys job. were, too. Like, what you can do with those two second-round picks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can get the you can get the quarterback, you can get the receiver there. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe one of the offensive tackles. Maybe you can get right. Jordan Morgan to play guard and tackle. Like, there's so many right. things you could use. Or you that finally pull an Eagles and you have your developmental tackle, like for the uh, first whatever. Time. Yes, so take like... your pick. So many fun things you could have done with that pick. You have to do the trade. I get it, but ah, yeah. uh, it killed me trading that first second round pick. Killed me. It is. It's yeah. tough, but I, yeah, go it, ahead. It, it, it killed us both. But before we transition away from the quarterback, John. If we're going to make a dart throw, the Giants are going to take a dart throw and it's not, say, at pick 47. Who would be a quarterback later in the draft that John Schmelk enjoys to watch? Yeah, I haven't I haven't deep dived these other quarterbacks. This is more on, on, the, on the periphery. Uh, Spencer Rattler, if he's there in round three, cool. I'm, I'm in. I'll roll the dice on him as a developmental guy. I think his toolbox is great, not the tallest guy. But look, honestly, at the senior bowl, I thought he was probably the best quarterback there. I think it, just in terms of arm talent and his ability to throw the football, you know, Penix was fine, but I thought Rattler looked the part. There's a reason he was considered like the next big thing in college football. And again, his situation at South Carolina was also brutal. Like they could it was not like Daniel Jones, him. 2023. I, I saw a stat today, his offensive line in 10 of 12 games, he had a different offensive line combination pressure on 40% of his dropbacks. That was exactly what the giants dealt with last year. Correct. Uh, look, at 100%. So I roll the dice on him. Uh, Devin Leary is a guy that intrigues me a little bit. I think he's got a big arm, and I think there's something there. Remember, he transferred his final year. It didn't really work out with his transfer, but I think he's a guy with the talent uh, to make something happen. And a lot of people like the Pratt kid from Tulane. I, mm -hmm. I think he's more of your high-end backup type than a guy that can be a future starter, but I, I think he has some ability um, as a quarterback. So I think those are the guys you can throw some darts at and, and see if one of them happens to hit. And just in terms of the quarterback guys, I think giant fans, and again, this is just my impression are more desperate for a quarterback than the giants are. Right. I think if there's yeah. a guy they think is special and Joe Shane's, I'm not breaking any news. Joe Shane has basically said this, right. Where, you know, if, you keep your eyes open. If a guy you think is going to be uh, unbelievable, you, of course you have to consider him. If he's the best player on your board, you figure out a way to pick him or trade up to get him. Right. But if they don't, I think they're more than willing to have Daniel Jones be the starter in week one. I know giant fans don't want to hear that, but 
that's my feel here. They're not just going to pick a quarterback for the sake of picking a quarterback. Right. That guy is going to have to be a guy that they think is going to be special. And that's how I, that again, Joe Shane has not said that to me, but based on all his public comments, that that's my impression of how they'll handle this situation I, I because I, them. you know, and I don't want to make, turn this into a Dan Jones conversation because it, <laughs> I think we're all tired of it at this point. Right. <laughs> but they went through how many games did he start in 2022? Started six, seven, 16 games, right? Because he rested the final game, game against right? Philadelphia, so right? One season, yeah. he didn't miss any games. Yeah. Right. So he started 16 games and then two playoff games. So that's 18 games worth of evaluation in 2016, right? Where the results overall for the offense were good. The Giants by EPA were almost a top 10 offense that year, right? The overall raw quarterback throwing stats could have been better, right? But Brian Dable figured out with Daniel Jones to be productive enough for the Giants to win games to make the playoffs. The next year, it was really, really bad. But why was it really, really bad? And it was really, really bad if you take the two half games that Daniel played with the injuries and you put them together. Basically played, what, five games, I think, right? So let's see. In those five games, he didn't have Saquon Barkley for three of them. He didn't have Andrew Thomas for any of them except for one where he was a shell of himself against Dallas in week one, right? One was against the Cowboys defense, one of the best in the league. One was against the Niners defense, one of the best in the league. One was against the Dolphins who took a lead early and then ran away with it. So these were situations where the car, it was really stacked against him. And I think while fans did not like the results, neither did we, neither did the Giants, but I don't think it's realistic to think that they've taken a complete 180 on their evaluation of a player over an 18 game sample with, by the way, not a great circumstance around. It's not like the Giants offensive line of 2022 was great. And they had these awesome wide receivers running around making all these great plays. It was fine, but it wasn't great into a, the worst situation in football around him as a quarterback spare for maybe the Patriots with their lack of weapons. Um, and they've completely changed their evaluation of the player. Like, I don't think, while some fans might think this way, the Giant fans are on like, yeah, let's give Daniel Jones a long-term big money contract. Then five games later with all the best players around him hurt, including, I didn't mention Darren Waller. He missed some of those games. And Wanda Robinson wasn't even back 100% early in the year either, by the way. So you're not going to flip 180 degrees on your evaluation off of that small of a sample and that bad of a situation. I, that, that's just not how the league works. Mm-hmm. So I think it's important that that fans think of it in that way um, before they decide that they're just going to throw the baby out with the bathwater and be done with it. That I don't think that's how they're thinking about this year. And I would also argue that that's the, the, it's not a good way to go about building your franchise to be like, I, I need a quarterback right now. I'm taking a quarterback. That's how the bad teams stay bad in the NFL. A lot of our, you know, a lot of people have argued with me because I'm, I'm at the point where, you know, as far as six goes, if, if it's a quarterback, I think can be top five or top 10, I'm in on it. And that goes for trading up as well for me, but I'm not taking a quarterback, just take a quarterback. And everyone's like, why would you take a receiver? If you don't have a court, if you, because they believe they don't have a quarterback in the roster. I'm fine with their evaluation of that, but it's like, it's not, this is not like the draft is not just like you draft a position that you think is what you need right now. You have to draft the right player because a lot of these draft picks don't work. Even the first rounders bust a lot of them across the board. You have to make sure you're locked into getting the right player. So I think that's important, John. We're going to move obviously to wide receiver. And by the way, you're right. My, 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 my tired fade through this process. And it is every year when fans call up and say, I want to draft this position, this round, this position around this position. <laughs> right. I hate that yeah. draft players you can't you do don't that draft <laughs> positions it's crazy and the way i'll just close this part of the conversation real quick whether you're not a draft a quarterback has nothing to do with daniel jones it, whether it you can't. draft the quarterback has to do, to do with, with your evaluation of the quarterback that you're drafting it has to that's all that should matter period stop it, it really has to. It's the only way. And I want to say one more thing before we close out quarterbacks about what you discussed with Penix and Knicks, because it is interesting how you have seen a lot of former quarterbacks talk about, you know, how they really like Penix and Knicks and a player like May, who we both had as our QB2, they don't like as much. And then you have other evaluators who like May and have Penix and Knicks a little lower. I think what you're saying is correct, though. Like a lot of what they're doing is staying on time within their offense. But the problem I have with that is they're 24 and 25 year old prospects. They're not 22 or 21 like May and McCarthy. They've had years in this system. Knicks has mastered that Oregon system. But guess what? That Oregon system doesn't translate at all to the NFL. So he could be on time all the time at Oregon. And it might not matter at all when he gets to the NFL because he's not running a system that's similar. And same thing for Penix. Like you talked about what what you uh, struggled with with Jaden as far as throwing over the middle of the field and that was a big reason in my mind why Justin Fields hasn't translated well guess who else has hadn't used the middle of the field at all it's Michael Penix that doesn't mean he can't but he hasn't yet and 
it's just something to consider with why some of these, I think some of the former quarterbacks love these guys because they, they are playing great within that system. They're on time more often than may. And some of these guys, but of course they are to me, they're 24 and 25 years old and they have more experience in the system. And by the way, Jaden Daniels is in that category too, right? I right. mean, he's been in college football a long time. He long started time. over 50, he started, I think over 50 games, if I'm not mistaken. Right. So agree hundred percent. Um, and again, I, I would be willing to, 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 to put a top 10 pick on, on, on Jaden Daniels. If I'm any team in the league that, that needs a quarterback, he just, just pushing the giants aside. He's below May and, and Williams for me, just because I, again, I don't think the ceiling is quite as high, but, um, yeah, look, I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think generally we're, we're fairly aligned here and, and yep. I think fairly, by the way, logical and, and fair minded in terms of the quarterbacks here, I think so. where you have to make the right decision for the franchise and do the best thing. And, and I, the, and I don't reply anymore because it just, it's just not worth it. Oh no. But there's nothing more annoying than when you put up a tweet <laughs> or someone, you know, we're, we're, we're promoting a podcast and I'm saying something nice oh, about Malik neighbors or Roma Dunze. And then the reply is, oh, if it's not a quarterback, it sucks. I, I'm like, this is a, no, I, I can't deal with you. Sorry. I, I saw, I was doing some research for this podcast, John, as a quick aside. And I, and I was, and I was watching some of your recent pods and I made the mistake of reading the comments, which is, which is always disaster. And, and, and I just see some of the things that they're saying, like, Oh, John Schmelke, he's in the, he's a Daniel Jones truth. He's a, he's a giant shell. I'm like, you guys have no idea how lucky you have it. Cause I'll be honest with you, John, this is not to toot your own horn. I listen to other content from other teams. You are very objective when it comes to team content. One of the most objective person I've ever heard who covers a team. I really I do believe that. And I know you try for that and you strive for that. And that is not the case for uh, across the board. If you, if you go to every team, you're going to hear some Homer stuff from other teams. So I just think they don't realize. I think these people are so dead set in their mind of, like you said, where they want it to be. And to some of them, you're right. It isn't about who that quarterback is. It is just about getting rid of Jones, which I don't think, you know, we've been criticized as well on the other side of that, John, uh, myself, especially of being like a Daniel Jones hater, the other side of that. But I, as you heard on this podcast, John, I'm not the one sitting here saying you got to take a quarterback no matter what it's six. It has to be the right guy. So let's get to why we might, the Giants might not take a quarterback at six. And that is this unbelievable plethora in my mind of top wide receiver prospects. I in my mind, in my evaluation, I'm curious where you stand on this. I went back and, and I didn't get your take on this, Nick. So I want to hear yours eventually. But as I went back through the last 10 draft classes, John, the top three receivers I have on my board in this class would be the first receiver I had in seven of the last 10 draft classes. Jamar Chase was one that it wasn't. And there was a couple others. But, man, I feel really strongly about all three of these guys. So let's get started with those guys. Where do you stand? And, and is it a big three for you or do you have somebody else in the mix there? No, I'm with you. Um, I think you're right. I'm curious to see who I'm curious who the other two wide receivers were that would have gotten into the mix there. Have to look I think back we're going, now. I think we're going too far back for Julio and, and Calvin, right? I think yeah. that that would, that would be past 10 years. I think who, you know, what was Julio 24, 2013, maybe I'm looking right now. Know. Cause I went back with no, Dan, you've brought this up okay. a couple different times on the podcast. Sure. Yeah. We went over the 2021 draft and Jamar chase, Devonta Smith and Jalen Waddle. Like, I think they're in the same league. They're all in that. Yeah, yeah. Like, I love these I three receivers. Don't get me wrong. But, like, I don't think they're Julio or I don't think they're Calvin Johnson. I think Marvin Harrison Jr., I love how technically sound he is. But those two were absolute freaks. And I don't think any of these three are those guys. Well, no, I don't they, think anyone's Calvin. I mean, Calvin yeah, is no just, Cal, Calvin's Calvin and Julio's right behind them. So I, I, I agree with that. But I think your point stands, Dan. I think any one of these three guys could be a number one wide receiver in your normal wide receiver class. Um, Harrison to me is just a freak show because he's six, three and a half, but he runs around like he's six feet tall and he runs route like routes, like a guy that's six three feet tall, it, you know, maybe his run after the catch isn't, you know, elite, but when that's your biggest weakness as a player and he checks every other box, you're pretty darn good. Um, and it's funny. We did a mock draft on draft season uh, the other day with Tony Pauline and our scenario. And we weren't planning this. We did it live where the first four picks were quarterback, the Vikings traded up to four. They drafted McCar uh, They actually drafted Drake May at four because the Patriots took um, McCarthy at three. And then the Chargers sat there at five. Instead of trading down, they drafted Joe Alt. Oh, wow. Which meant, guess what? Dream Marvin scenario. Harrison's sitting there at five. So that is not completely unrealistic. Like, that is not a scenario that's impossible now. So Giant Finch can have a little bit of hope there for Marvin. I have neighbors slightly behind him. Um, but close, he's just so explosive and I hate helmet scouting. And I always tell people don't helmet scout, but he's Odell Beckham jr. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. what the guy is. I mean, his gets the ball 
Giant fans remember those slants that he ran for touchdowns mm-hmm. against the Ravens and whatever year that was. That's what this kid can do. He's that good of a football player. He's phenomenal. Um, you know, he, his route running is a little bit raw. He had a little bit better, some body catches. But look, he hasn't been – he wasn't this five-star recruit that's been like this highly tatted guy his whole career. He's kind of a blue-collar guy. I had a chance to talk to Gordy Rush, who's the LSU sideline reporter uh, on Big Blue Kickoff Live this week. And that was my first question. I'm like, guy, uh, Gordy, is, is this guy a diva? He's like, no, blue-collar guy. Like, he's love not that. that type of guy, which I love to hear too. And then at Dunes, yeah, I have – uh, Dunze, pardon, not in a different tier, but I do have clear separation between him and okay. neighbors. And ironically, because I don't think a Dunze separates well enough from corners when he's in that tight man to man coverage. Now, the thing about it is that a Dunze is so sound, strong, and tall, and has such good body control and ball tracking that he doesn't need a ton of separation. To That's what I'm saying. Does it even matter if he separates? With it that reminds kind of me a little bit, and, and and Greg Cosell yelled at me about this at the combine, but I'll oh. I'll stick with it at, at, at risk. You know, when Jamar Chase came out, he wasn't a guy that was getting ridiculous separation on plays either, but he's so good at winning at the catch point. All he needed was a yard of separation, and he would be moving at a fast speed but he could control his body so well, he would always beat the cornerback to the football. That's what I see in Roma Dunze. And he blocks. This is a guy that broke his ribs and played two weeks later in a big game. He's tough. He's Team big. Captain. He's tall. He's got awesome hands. I haven't heard one person say a bad thing about the guy. Um, he's built like a tank. He's your prototypical X wide receiver. I actually think he fits in the Giants wide receiver room as a player better than neighbors, even though I like mm. neighbors more as a player. But, yeah, these guys are all great. Give me any one of them at six, and I'll walk out of that first round of the draft a very happy man. Absolutely would love that. And we see this wide receiver class very similarly. Because that's exactly – Dan, I don't want to speak for you, but it's Marvin Harrison Jr. Neighbors is slightly behind. And a little bit of a drop-off with the Dunes. But, like, if we're sitting here at six as Giant fans and a Giants podcast, and it's Roma Dunes at six, like, I'm not going to be upset. Uh, Dan, I don't think you would be upset, would you? No, no, so I, like, actually, I have him a little closer to neighbors than, than you guys do. A little bit. Would you pick? No. Would either of you pick Bowers over any of those three wide receivers? No, no, not me. I think the, ba- the Bowers situation. What somebody pointed out to me that really stands out about it is if you draft Bowers, he's immediately one of the highest paid tight ends in the NFL. And I just I think about that sometimes, and I just think about where she, Joe Shane's at with positional value, and I just don't know if that fits with what he's now what I he do think him. second contracts for tight ends are generally a yeah, bargain. Right? Cheap, yeah. So get the bargain on the second an X wide right. receiver and he's making what 16 million dollars yes. a year. So I think it comes back and helps you later. Maybe you're right, right yeah. on the rookie contract. It doesn't help you quite as much. <laughs> yeah, true. And I'd be curious. One thing is before we move past these three is I will be curious to see if both neighbors and Odunze, I, we, I keep getting this name, right. It's a, do you know it for sure? John is it definitely Odunze. It is Odunze. Okay. I got it. Three get syllables. I, I was accidentally saying Odunze for about two months, but it is yeah. Odunze. 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 All right. I got to get this in, but I actually wouldn't be totally shocked if they're both on the board and the Giants select Odunze because or Odunze because <laughs> <laughs> I did the Odunze. <laughs> now I screwed head, you dude. up even more. You got yeah. it. Dude, that was because, because of what you said, he might fit what the Giants need in their wide receiver room a little bit more. And just some of some of the things that Joe Shane's look for in wide receivers kind of stand out off the field. Smart, tough, defendable, man. Yeah. So I'll be curious to see what what happens with that, and I don't want to put too much, but you know, Sean O'Hara, you know, pumping him up a couple months ago definitely yeah. caught my radar. When he was oh, like, by the way, just for the record, I want to set the record straight here. I talked to Sean about that. Yeah, I'm like, Sean, what was that? He goes, Yeah, I just said he's a guy I think the Giants would like. No one in the organization told me they loved the Dunze. So I, I so I, I literally, uh, he was laughing when I asked that right. question. Never mind so, what I said. So don't don't point. take too much away from that. Just, just that's great. Bored. <laughs> that's great. I love that. As far as the receivers go, though, John, there's a couple other. I want to get into some other prospects after those three, and and I want to start with more uh, thirty thousand foot view question though first on that. Sure. Some people have asked us this, and people discuss this with us at times. In at any point in your mind, because we're both obviously we can you can tell by listening to this podcast, anyone's heard this. We all view these players as blue chip prospects, those three, and would would be blue chips in any class. But do you think that at any point the absurd amount of depth and talent at those wide receiver positions? I really do feel like there's 10 to 12 guys that are really good in this class, should impact the Giants' decision when it comes to do you draft a wide receiver at six or do you try to wait and get one at 47? 
No, because I think you can wait and get a guy, but I don't think you can wait and yeah. get the guy. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm, and, and there's course. a difference. The Giants have a bunch of good guys already, but they don't have the guy. You need the guy. Now, is there a chance that Brian Thomas Jr. can become the guy with his overall skill set? Sure, he's got a long way to go from a fundamental standpoint. Does A.D. Mitchell have the physical ability and body type to be the guy one day? Sure. And second of all, neither one of those two guys are going to make it. The Probably the not. Right. Definitely. But like those are two guys I think could do it. Uh, Troy Franklin, does he have a shot? Sure. He's also 175 pounds. So mm-hmm. that that's a legitimate worry. But I think he's a really good player. But, you know, then you get into the Lad McConkie, who I really like. But really? is he a number one? Right. I don't know. Roman Wilson, I like. Is he a number one? Eh, I don't know. Ricky Pearsall, really like. Is he a number one? Eh, I Even don't know. Even a Keon Coleman, who has the body type, but isn't really like A.D. Mitchell, doesn't move like him. There are no four six one speeded right. uh, number one wide receivers. Yeah. Right. Right? I mean, they're, they're, again, I think he's going to be a good player, player. Sure. and yeah. I think he'd be a good value at, at 47 if the Giants don't pick a wide receiver and he's sitting there at 47, pick Keon Coleman. Cool. I got no problem with that. That's great. But again, he's sure. not going to be a guy that other teams are going to game plan for, yep. right? Now, are one of these second day wide receivers going to turn out to be a really good player and be like a, you know, everyone wants the next Puka Nakua now, right? Yeah. Pro- one of the guys is probably going to become that. Are you willing to bet you can pick the one yeah, out of 20 right. that are going to be on the board? That that That's not an easy thing to do. So, sure. no, I, I think if you're looking to add to your room and you already have your number one, could you say, yeah, let's wait? Absolutely. When you're looking for a guy that you think is going to be the number, that you need to be your number one, you pick him at six. That's a great point. You could have your pick of both. I don't think so, but if they're both sitting there, I'm very curious as to which direction, because I think you're accurate here, John, and I think Dan and I spoke about this recently. I think Odunze fits it better, fits the room and complements the room, and it can be that a factor, that force multiplier that you were talking about earlier in the podcast. Yeah, look, I think you can't go wrong with any one of the three. And I think it'll autumn again. I said this earlier. I'll just repeat myself because I really think not enough people are talking about this. The Giants' two best weapons heading into the last scene was Saquon Barkley and Darren Waller. As of right now, we don't know if either one is going to be on the team this year. Right. Who is going to be a difference maker on offense to help this offense score points? Guys, this offense does not score enough points. We've been <laughs> saying all. this for 10 years. They need to score more points. You score, look, you can have the best offensive coordinator in the world. You know, you can, Brian Dable can be a genius. If you don't have guys that can go out there and make plays and not the design plays, plays that you go above what the design is, right? You can't do it. You need those guys. And it's hard to find, can you find those guys later in drafts? Sure. But if you look at the most special wide receivers, that that in terms of being physically gifted over the last 10 years, a lot of them are top 10 picks, right? Or top 11 picks, whether it's Odell Beckham Jr. Or it's Calvin Johnson or it's Julio Jones or it's AJ Green Mark or it's Chase. Jamar Chase. Go, you know, go down the list. A lot of them are in that group. Now, are there outliers like a Devontae Adams? Sure. Um, you know, Justin Jefferson was still a top 20 pick, right? Stefan Diggs was, you know, just, just, it's, it is what it is. You can't pass on that opportunity to get a guy that at a position, by the way, that translates really well to the NFL where, I mean, I think you've the chance of any three of those guys spare injuries, not working out to me is infinitesimal. So, right. It's such a safe pick with the high upside at a premium position that you need. Why wouldn't you do it? And there's, there's the financial side of it too that you meant that you mentioned, John, because it's like we've seen these wide receiver contracts in free agency just absolutely explode, man. I mean, like the fact that and and he was a good prospect coming out to an extent, but he has a lot of tape that wasn't great. Jerry Judy, the fact that he got that kind of deal with that kind of tape so far in the NFL is crazy, but it's not when you look at the rest of these contracts that these receivers have gotten. So now you get a guy who's on the rookie deal, but now if he's great, they're probably, again, they're probably negotiate at some point, but you're at least going to get two, three years on a really good value price. And you know, Joe Shane values that type of thing. So it's interesting, but I want to say this, John, um, and by the way, anyway. just wait until, uh, Justin Jefferson and CD lamb get paid. I know for the $35 million. Dallas is that's where the contracts are going to be, by the way. I know Dallas with, with Jefferson 
Dax contract that they've pushed back over the years, year after year, and then Micah Parsons. I don't know what don't Dallas think... is doing with their cat management, dude. I don't. I don't know. They are. They're just with kicking fire the down there. I, I don't know what they're doing. Hopefully, I just, it helps the Giants. <laughs> I know people who work like I know somebody who works for the Cowboys, and he's told me he doesn't think that they're gonna have. They're going to be one of those guys might walk Parsons or, or, or Lamb, and they're not going to have an opportunity to keep them both, which is crazy to think about. It's not a guarantee or anything, but just there's a possibility that they or can maybe actually walk one of those two out the That's door. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, and it could maybe be Dak. Dak walks and they keep the other two. That wouldn't right. surprise me either. I, I If I look at this isn't a Cowboys podcast, but if they really were going to play this game with Dak, I would have. I know he's a no trade clause. I would have approached him in the offseason to Dak, where would you want to get traded and mm -hmm. see if and if, see if you could work out a deal because. Uh, he has them over a hill and he's going to basically, he's going to be able to do whatever he wants next off season. The Cowboys can do nothing about it. Yep. And if you're him, you're not settling for less because there's just no, no point. The market is so heavy, but I want to talk a little bit more about the giants in the draft. So it's an interesting spot at six because it's so much more defined than recent years. I think in part because of the Brian Burns trade, I really don't think edges in the mix anymore at that. Nope. And it might've been before that. And then tackle. I love Joe Alt as a prospect, but I'm just not at the point yet where I think, especially after signing Illuminor and just recently investing in Neil, where they're going to make that move. It wouldn't totally shock me, but not really at that point yet. And then after Agreed. that, it's like, um, you agree on that. So then after yep. that, it's like, you also have to like flip them, by the way, to the right side, which is another thing. Right. And that's the and other another problem. level of risk to it. So just no yes. thanks. I'll pass. Exactly. So then after that, it's not in the many other positions. You mentioned Bowers, maybe there's no safeties or anything like that in this class. So, Let's say they do go the only other route that is possible in my mind besides receiver really or likely, I should say. And it is quarterback in round one. You mentioned before that you you don't want to get yourself uh, in a position where you have to pick the next Puka Nakua or uh, Amon Ross St. Brown type. But you've done a lot of work on this class, John. So I want to know, as far as day two wide receivers go in this class, who are some of John Schmelk's favorites that you think if you had to put your money down, you could find the net. If you had to say, somebody told you, I got to find the next Amon Ross St. Brown, who would that be for you? Those All right, I'm opening up my electronic yeah. notebook here because I don't want to, I've watched about 20 of these guys because there's so many of them. So I want to make sure I don't forget some of these names. Guys that I like, um, I'm going to, there's going to be a lot of names here, guys, but guys that I particularly <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I think Malachi Corley is going to be a good pro. Um, oh yeah. He's a, he's Talk a about really it. Really good run after catch guy. I stood next to him and interviewed him for about six minutes at the senior bowl. And he was, he's literally built like Saquon Barkley. That's what he looks like. And I've stood I've stood next to Saquon Barkley for six or seven years. And that's what Malachi Corley is built. Like he is wow. a freaking tank. Um, but he's, you know, he's got shorter arms. He's not built like a wide receiver, but you draft him. I think he's a little redundant with Wondell Robinson, just in terms of the role they would play. Um, their size is very different, but I think they would both be kind of those slot yak type wide receivers. Uh, but I think he's a really good player. And I think, boy, he's going to be in this new, uh, with this new kick return game that they have, yeah. he is going to be a kick returner dude. And he's going to be really, really good at it. Um, love Troy Franklin. Um, and I think that's a guy that, that could be available in the second round for a guy, his size. And he's, let me see what he measured in at when all is said and done. I think he measured in around six two at the combine, if I remember properly. He's another guy that runs routes like a guy that's three inches shorter. He gets in and out of his routes for a guy his size so well. He so catches quick. the ball well. He's a little light in the pants again, but again, a deep threat. He just runs past people fast, can catch, good route runner. Um, I think he's a guy that could become a very good NFL wide receiver. I'm not the biggest Xavier Leggett guy. Um, he's built like a really good yak player. I don't see a really good yak player on tape in my opinion. And he's a six, one contested catch guy. That's, that's dangerous yeah. to me. Um, so I worry that's about him a little bit, too. really like lad McConkey. I think if you look at his profile, you know, whose profile looks like spare the production, Justin Jefferson, Ooh, like if wow. you look at his physical profile and his measurements and how he ran compare the two very similar. Now, not nearly as productive. I worry about his ability to stay healthy because he never did that in Georgia. But he is the best route runner in the draft. He comes in and out of his breaks at the top of his routes better than any player in this draft that's including the top three. He got open all day long at the Senior Bowl. Um, really good player. Again, not sure he's a one, but I think he would be a really, really good two in that class. Um, love AD Mitchell. If, if I'm not, if I'm picking after 15 and I want an X receiver, 
I have Mitchell ahead of Brian Thomas Jr. on my uh, draft I, board. I don't want to speak for Nick, but I think both of Nick and I have that yeah. the same. Yeah. Now, I talked to somebody that covered him at Texas, and there's focus things there. It's like You well, can why, see it on tape. When the play is not to his side, he just takes it off a lot of the time. It's crazy to watch. Right. And you wonder why that switch isn't turned on all the time, right? I don't know. And, you know, in the same interview, and we interviewed him on Big Blue Kickoff, uh, the report, and, you know, he brought up the point that at the combine, you know, he was asked about, you know, plays. And Mitchell basically said at the combine that, you know, when I knew the play wasn't going to me, I just didn't run full speed. That's that. that <laughs> it that's actually not happens. The best. Yeah. It's no, not, it's not great. It's not the best. No. But again, I, I, but I, I think the tools are phenomenal. No. So I do like him as a player. Um, second round, you want a guy that can become an X wide receiver and has a shot. I think Devontae Walker has a shot to become an X mm, yep. in the second round. I and I think that. he's a guy you can get later than the other guys we talked about earlier. Really good vertical player. Couldn't catch a cold at the senior bowl, but you watch the tape. That's not really that big of a problem for him. He got open at the senior bowl. I think he has a lot of work to do to become a nuanced route runner, but he's fast and he's big. And I think he can develop into a really good player. Uh, I like Ricky Pearsall. Um, I've got to rewatch the last half of his season, but really good hands, really fast, good height, good length. I think he can be a pretty good all-around player. And then a couple of guys that I like later, and again, guys, this is such a deep class. Yeah. Um, like day three, you want a, a slot guy? Go draft Malik Washington. Yeah. Um, he's small, but he's thick, catches everything. He was really good in Frisco when I watched him down there. And then I like Roman Wilson out of Michigan. I think he's going to be a late second round, third round pick. I think he's more of your vertical slot. He's really fast. And as much as people say J.J. McCarthy was hurt by the, the style of the Michigan uh, offense, so was Roman Wilson and yep. his teammate Cornelius Johnson, by the way, who I think he's a chance to be a pretty good uh, vertical receiver on, on day three of this draft. You know, they didn't get a lot, of, a, a lot of reps, but those are guys that I think are all really good players. And, and I actually like Jalen McMillan more than I like Me too. Hope in, in Washington. He's six one. Um, he ran well enough at the combine. He's got good hands. I think he created separation better than either Polk or Dunze in that Washington offense. Um, I did get a good stat off of pro football focus. He's like in the two second percentile in terms of contested catch rate, which is not what you want, <laughs> yeah. but that maybe that means he's a slot guy. Right. And he's, he's right. not a guy, despite the fact he's six foot six, one, he can play outside. But I also think Jay McMillan's going to be a really good pro. So, if you're looking for a receiver and in, in, in round two or round three, even the start of round four of this draft, and that's not even counting guys like, you know, Brendan Rice, who I think is going to be a solid no. pro. His teammate, Taj Washington, I think is pretty good. Um, he ran really poorly at the combine, but the Illinois receiver, Isaiah Williams, I think he has some ability as, as, as a potential slot guy. So, look, there are a lot of guys here that can play that go well into day three in this draft. It is a deep, deep, deep wide receiver draft. And other people love Javon Baker. I have not, you know, done the deep dive in this maybe a lot of people love javon baker central florida i haven't watched baker yeah so ton of guys like we can go on and on in this wide receiver quest and there's a bunch of different flavors too right like you have you have the flash david worthy's in this draft he's the flash you have the big guy who's fluid like troy franklin there's a bunch of different flavors that can be had at different areas of the draft and jermaine burton too at alabama that's what i'm gonna say burton's the craziest one all his off-field stuff whatever it may be who knows but as far as on field, I watched one game because someone's like, dude, you got to watch this guy. He's like a top. And I was like, yeah, this guy really is awesome on tape. His on field stuff isn't the only stuff that's crazy, though. So that's something. To I know. I heard. Yeah, it's not just the on field. Yeah. The it's a good way to put yeah. it right there. Yeah. I want to transit. Oh, wait, what, you, what you got, Dan? We can transition right after. We want to be cognizant of time, so we're going to wrap this up soon. It's been really fun, and it just the time flew by. So we're going to and thank you for taking all this time for us. No, John. no but worries, guys. This is one fun. thing you mentioned earlier that stuck stuck with me is. You know, when you do these drafts, especially somebody like Joe Shane, who's got, who I know, and, and Giants fans can say what they want, but I think his process has been spot on. Some of the picks haven't worked out how we wanted yet, but it's early. But and that happens to everyone, by the way. Yes, everyone exactly. misses picks, even the best ones. And, you know, people are going to be mad at Evan Neal. Well, guess, uh, look what the offensive tackle picked right before him has done in Carolina. Right. He hasn't played well either. Charles crosses at injury issues. This right. happens. That's and that's one of the best the teams at evaluating O linemen, the Cowboys, had Neil as their number one overall player on the board that year, and they've hit every O lineman. They've I hit didn't know that. Is that true? Yeah, leak. Jerry yeah. Jones. I don't know how this happens. Like this happened like four times in the last. Well, oh, Jerry years. Jones shows the draft board. Like, shows the draft board. It's crazy. He's, I've seen like four Cowboys draft boards leak, but that was one of them, and he had Neil one. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so, you know, you're going to miss sometimes. But as far as process goes, it's been great. But you mentioned, like, you draft the player. You don't draft the position. And you draft positions of value. So it wouldn't shock me if the Giants draft a receiver at six, whether it be neighbors over Dunze and or Dunze. And round three, round four, the best player on their board by far is a receiver. And they double up. And they, I like what they have already in the room. But they still may do something like that. So it's important to know the names that John brought up and some of these sleeper receivers that could be there on day three for the Giants or day two, late day two. I remember John. Oh, kick go, kick go. returner. They need it. Everyone, every oh, team yeah, needs a kick returner need. now. So if you can find the like the the athlete that you can just put back there to return kicks. I'm psyched about the role, by the way. I think I'm that's excited be a lot too. Of fun this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. And yeah, it's going to it's going to be excellent. And cornerbacks a position that could possibly be kick returners as well. And right. I want to transition real quick to the cornerback spot. Bring up one name and then just ask you your overall opinion on the cornerback position because the Giants right now we don't necessarily know who the starting cornerback opposite of Deontay Banks is. So I want to ask you about Max Melton, who is a local guy. He's from New Jersey. His brother was drafted, I think, seventh round last year. Bo Melton and uh, the Giants. My reports seem to be interested in him. I, he was one of the first cornerbacks I actually watched this offseason. I was really surprised about just how explosive he was. Now, he doesn't really maintain the best body relationship on the vertical plane while in man coverage, but all the athletic traits are there to suggest that with the technique was cleaned up by Jerome Henderson, man coverage is something that he could excel at. So I want to ask you, what are, what are your opinions of Max Melton? Have you seen a lot of Max Melton? And what are your opinions on the cornerback class? Yeah, I have not deep dive on corners yet. I'm trying to finish my offensive players. Gotcha. Just Tony Pauli and I in draft season are doing our top 10 offensive position rankings next week. And I'm like, nice. oh boy, I'm not, I'm not even close to being ready for that yet. <laughs> yeah. So I've been I've been going off on offensive players these last two weeks. And then we're doing defense the week after. Um, but look, I, I have not dived did, you know, done a deep dive into his tape yet, but I did watch him closely at the senior bowl. And I did re-review that senior bowl tape a few weeks ago. And here are my notes. Long arms. Should be able to play inside and outside, despite the fact that I think he's listed just under six feet tall. Uh, showed very good speed. To your point, Nick, struggled to mirror at times in man coverage, where he got let the guy get loose a little bit. But I, I agree. I think he has the right attitude, too. He's a bulldog. He's thick. He's strong yeah. um, for, for a guy his size. I think he's a guy, some people say second round. I think for me, he's more of an early third round pick. Um, I'm not sure I'd pick him at 47. He'd be right on, on, on the line there. You know, I don't know if Ennis Rackestraw is going to be there. Is Kamari Lassiter going to be there? You know, who has the Kamari Lassiter 40 yard dash time right from the pro day? Dude, it, don't even get me started on that. Man. It, you know, and you know, Tony Pauline, who I do my podcast with, he, you know, talks to all these scouts and agents. He tells me they had him anywhere from like four, five, one to four, five, five, somewhere in that range. And then Dane Brugler, who is phenomenal. I love Dane. We have him on all the time. Right. He has, he swears that scouts Tom was a four, six, one. So I don't know. And that matters <laughs> by the way, that, that, oh, that the corner, second especially. is pretty darn important. So I think he's more of a slot than an outside guy, Lassiter, but he's a good player. Um, TJ Tampa. I have not, you know, taken a deep dive on him yet. I think he's interesting size profile out there. I know his top speed isn't great, but if you're playing more zone coverage, you need a guy that, that runs a four, four, probably not. Um, so I think there are some, Second round guys, but I think second round corner is the most likely pick because once you get too deep into drafts, yeah. it's very hard to find corners. Right. Because it's one of the toughest positions in the league to play. So I think if you're going to get one, you better get one around two before it dries up. This is going to dry up quick. And the Giants have been rumored in both Joe Shane drafts to have interest in certain corners who were in that range. They didn't take them. Sometimes they went a couple picks before. There was one year, I believe, a team traded right up before the Giants and select them. I think it was the first year, Shane, right before the Wandel Robinson. Yeah, it was Andrew they, Booth. Andrew Booth. That, that, these are reports. They may not be true. But the yeah. point being, like you said, John, you don't you don't wait to get corner. It's the, the, the further you go in the draft. And this is not us saying you have to draft a corner in round two. Like we said at the beginning, you don't draft positions. But what you're saying is that Corner is going to be a position where if the value meets up with the with the you know with the need there and it's the best player or it's on their board close to the best player, it's a position that they might take. So something Nick and I have to do a little bit more work on as well, just to, to get a range of players that we feel comfortable with the Giants maybe targeting. Yeah, in that range. and again, remember the corner was the most important position in Wink Martindale's system. Right, the most important. Wink said that to me. He's like, look, I can I can generate pass rush with his bajillion yep. blitzes and schemes. I can't generate coverage. So is that position as important in Shane right. Bowen's system? What type of corners does Shane Bowen want? I have no idea. Okay. I, I can tell you exactly the type of corner that Wink Martindale wants. 
doesn't help us right now. Yeah, I, I don't know. know the type of corner that that Shane Bowen wants to be totally honest with you. You know, you go back, the guys he had in Tennessee were a lot of different shapes and sizes. There True. isn't a clue there as the, exactly the, the, the body type of corner that he wants. So I do think that's interesting if they do deem that as important a position given the, you know, split safety zone, heavy scheme. And, you know, to your point, it's, it, it's a lot of matchup scheme, right? You, you're in quarters, right. then you basically play man based on who's in your zone. That's how all these college systems are doing it. That's what Mike McDonald does, which everyone's copying yep. at the pro level. Yep. But, you know, how important is is that corner position to, to Shane Bowen? Or would you rather invest in a pass rushing defensive tackle, right? Because if you want a good right. pass rushing defensive tackle, you got to pick him in the second or third round too. So what's the priority there? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Joe Shane is going to talk to the media at some point before we get to the uh, draft. I'm sure he's not going to say anything. Don't expect any answers. But, that yeah, no, I love that. Joe. He doesn't give anything but away there. That's our last chance. So we'll, we'll see what happens. And, I, and my guess is that we're not going to have a chance to talk to the coaches or coordinators until after yeah. uh, after the draft when uh, OTAs get kicked off. So Which makes sense. I guess we'll have to just wait and see on that one. Yep, and that's the draft. That's the beauty and the fun of the draft. John, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was amazing. As always, the fans are going to love it. And before we get out of here, John, why don't you let everybody know where they can find all of your work? And if they, and I don't know if you're a Twitter shout-out guy, but if you want to sh sh shout out your social handle, you can do that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I post all of our episodes on Twitter, so you can okay. find me at, at Schmelk. You can see the little lower third on the bottom if you're listening to the audio, uh, at S-C-H-M-E-E-L-K. And I post all our episodes. Uh, we got three podcasts and live shows going hot and heavy right now. Our flagship show is Big Blue Kickoff Live. It's live every day from 1230 to 1.30. We take calls from fans and talk draft. Right now we're doing a bunch of uh, reporters from different colleges talking about the pro days and kind of what they learned about the players, covering them at their individual schools. We just did uh, LSU and Clemson today, which is interesting. A lot of good players from those. So you guys should go uh, check those out. Good conversation. Um, then we have the John Soto podcast, which is our interview podcast. Uh, to the chagrin of my editors, we're doing basically one every day <laughs> the past <laughs> week, and we're doing it for the next couple weeks. We have some really good episodes up there, and I'm not one to pat myself on the back, but we did Stephen Ruiz this week from The Ringer, who does I heard that one. quarterback Great ranking, episode. and he talked about how you evaluate college quarterbacks, which was fascinating. Um, I just The one I did with Nate Tice went up today, who's on the Athletic Football Show, which is one of the best football podcasts out there. Uh, we do a lot of quarterback offensive line and kind of day two uh, guys at running back, corner, guard. Those are the spots that we hit with him along with quarterback and offensive line uh, and, and and some wide receiver in that mix too. Uh, next week, this isn't done yet, but I think we're going to be able to get Kurt Warner on to talk about Ooh, nice. quarterback evaluation in the draft. So that should be a lot of fun. We'll have Dane Brugler on once his beast gets uh, released. Working on Thomas Dimitrov, former general manager. So we hope we're going to have him on talk about what this preparation process is like for uh, general managers at this time of year. So a lot of good conversations and different types of topics, along with you know your draft experts. We had Eric Edholm on. We had Chad Ryder on. We had Matt Miller coming up from ESPN. So a, a lot of stuff in the Giants Little Podcast. I think fans will really enjoy. And then finally, the draft season, which is our once a week draft only podcast, and we do this all year round, folks. We take a hiatus in. Uh, June, July, and August when really nothing's going on and God, I need to rest. But <laughs> from basically August to April, we go once a week with Tony Pauline. Tony is one of the longest standing draft analysts. He's been doing this forever. He's got great sources. He does great evaluations. And uh, we basically talk draft every week and that's not necessarily giant centric. That's more overall right. draft. We'll do mock drafts. We do team needs, position ranking groups and things like that. So those are our main three podcasts. You can find it on the giants app. Giants.com slash podcast, or just search for any of the three big blue kickoff giant huddle draft season on your favorite podcast platform. It is all there. Yeah. And they're all on YouTube as well. For those who would like yes. to watch to consume their content as well. And it is funny. Cause you mentioned he take fan phone calls, John, and you guys will take, I mean, if you're a fan, you want your call answered. They'll, they'll, they'll take almost any call. I heard one that went viral a couple, maybe it was weeks or months ago. The chart, uh, Chaz Vacchiano. That was just a really funny one. <laughs> so. in Portland, Maine. And, and and then he, he and he got to ask Joe Shane a question at the combine too. I, so I heard he him will, ask Joe Shane the question. That was you know wild. people people always joke with us that you know they oh you guys screen calls you know you right. you, no, you, 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 know, you don't want angry fans you don't let people call on guys. The only way I ban somebody <laughs> is if they're rude, a jerk, or yeah. they curse. That's yeah. literally the only people, and that's and then it's usually temporary. So. Yeah. You you want to call and complain and whatever that's fine. Look, I'll I'll give my opinion. You might not like that, but right. Please call in. We 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 love to talk Giants football all year round. 
It's truly a phenomenal show. And John is one of the hardest workers that I know in the business. Just you going over that just made my head spin. Just going over all the all the shows. You did, like, holy I apologize for the long answer again. No, it's amazing <laughs> that you're doing all that kind of work. And it is great work. So you guys should check it out. I'm sure you got most most people listen already do. But thank you again, John, for taking the time tonight. And for everybody else, have a great rest of your week. And we'll talk to you soon. Take care, John.